Hello, and thank you for listening to Renewables, a podcast by Biostar, which aims to explore the current and future energy landscape in America. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Renewables. Uh, the first ever Renewables episode recorded in my home office. So uh, welcome to my home. And um, I have Mahomes and the boys uh, behind me. Hopefully we're a few far enough removed from the Super Bowl that we've forgotten um, all about that, that game. But anyways, uh, I have a baby coming any day. So we're being safe and quarantining at home. And so uh, we're coming at you live from from Kansas City, Missouri today. And we really appreciate Sean Kelly, the CEO of Amperon, coming back on the show um, to talk about Texas, what happened in Texas. And uh, obviously big national news, everybody you know in the industry and outside of the industry has been talking about this. So Sean, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Uh, it's great to see you and always great to have you on the as a guest. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for having me again. And I'm in the guest room. I got I got pushed in here today. Just the joys of still COVID and working from home and uh, all that fun stuff. And hey, at least you have the chief stuff up there. We're we're just giving away the Texans in Houston. We've decided just completely <laughs> throw in the towel. Because and you have a baby on the way as well, right? Yeah, we're two months behind you. So the wife is it's baby shower weekend. We got all of that. Um, so my uh, my last. Uh, two weeks has not been very, not, I guess, been distracted work-wise, but also obviously have a lot of the same uh, honeydews, I guess, that, that you know very well. Sure. Yeah, it's been a crazy uh, month for, for the whole industry. And so let's start on a personal level. You know, you're obviously in Houston. Um, was, how how'd you do? Did you have power? Did you not have power? It was a scary week there. Yeah, it was uh, it was interesting for sure. Basically, the Thursday before it happened, so this happened Valentine's weekend, and uh, the Thursday before it happened, we knew it was going down. Our meteorologists had been saying this a, about a week or so out. Um, I had I've had associates and colleagues of mine. Evan Karen sent me a text where he like called it on the fourth of February when prices were still trading really low and. So kind of knew it was happening, had that buildup, had a lot of uh, some press, had some really good press. Um, Tough Venturing, my favorite energy blog to read, and they, without us knowing, uh, announced announced, um, that energy suppliers should use us. They're not an investor or anything. So that was very flattering. That was that Saturday, uh, just all hands on deck for customers all weekend, then Valentine's happened. So... Uh, I posted on LinkedIn, like I knew it was going to get bad. I knew we were going to have rolling blackouts. And so post on LinkedIn, uh, whatever little bit I could do, just saying, hey, here's some ideas. And one of the things that I joked about was a candlelight dinner for Valentine's Day. Uh, so sure enough, just to take my own advice, wife and I had a nice uh, candlelight dinner uh, and knew on Sunday that the lights were going out. So just from being a trader for 12 years and having gone through this before being on the wrong side of the polar vortex, uh, which was not fun. And I lived in Chicago. So, um, then seeing summer 2011, the firm I was at at that time was on the right side of summer 2011 in ERCOT where you had record heat building, but just knew that just that feeling in your gut, you knew it was going to happen. Uh, so went to bed at midnight, woke up at 2 AM, and just checked all the pipes were dripping, everything like that, and knew it was gonna happen. Power went off at 5 a.m. Again, seven month pregnant wife. Uh, We just stuck it out for about 12 hours. And finally, a good friend of mine uh, called and said, you gotta get over here. He's like, it's freezing. Like your wife, uh, he and the wife are good friends. He's like, you and Tati, you gotta get over here. You gotta stay with us. Uh, So we wound up staying two nights um, at my buddy Josh's house because he lives downtown and they kept the lights downtown. Um, the federal prison's down there, literally next door to him. So we figured that would be like a pretty good, if they shut down the electricity to that, we've got bigger issues. Um, right. And so we just went down there and stayed, uh, but he took in the multiple other people and probably literally probably two thirds of the people I knew in Houston, everyone I was texting 
we're out, we're out, we're out. Um, so it's just crazy to see you think, oh, it's power outage. Like I'll just go here or go there. But literally I probably knew three people that were uninterrupted, um, wow. out of the like, dozens and dozens I text. And so that happened. And then we came back to our house Wednesday evening um had some work stuff so couldn't check on it earlier i think we came on that wednesday morning uh but then the water went out and so it was just kind of a calamity uh just a perfect storm literally and the thing the thing that really gets me and uh, obviously we'll get into more of this later is just the winterization um after living in chicago after living in new york it wasn't that cold we went on two three mile walks every single day uh so the technology is there to winterize us for these things Chicago, I mean, I've seen these temperatures in April when I lived up there. Uh, April 2015, I remember that was when winter showed up late. And it was definitely, we got, I think we got as low as 12 degrees Fahrenheit here. And again, cold, but I mean, Europe, Europe a little north of me, 12 degrees you've definitely seen before. And right. it's, it's not fun, but it's, it's happened. Windmills can be used to it. Windmills run in places that are significantly colder than Texas. Um, and same thing from, uh, from a natural gas standpoint, from a coal standpoint, just all of the plants. It was just a, just a disaster of not weatherizing plants uh, well enough is I think one of the underlying problems. Yeah, and it's, uh, first of all, glad you had somewhere to go. Uh, I know folks in Dallas and Houston and Austin, everybody sort of had different stories. One of my buddies pitched a tent in his apartment and had all of his camping gear, loves to camp, so I had big sleeping bags and stuff and, and made do that way. But um, glad, glad you had a place to stay and, and that um, you were safe, first of all. And then secondly, I do think it's interesting, we don't really get into politics on the show, but of course this became politicized and it was, oh, renewable energy failed, and then it was no, gas failed. And, and so interesting to hear you mention just sort of the weatherization in general, whether no matter what type of plant you are, and not that we necessarily want to point fingers or, or find one you know bad guy, but whose fault is that? I mean, who, is there a state sort of standard that's followed or who's to blame for the lack of preparedness uh, for these cold events and winterization? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think everyone can kind of get on board and say weatherization, we should have it. Uh, I mean, this happened in 2011. It's not like this happened, like, so the pandemic happened. When's the last pandemic? 1917, 100 year event. When the last one happened in 2011 and before that happened in 89, it's a recurring theme. Obviously climate change is not, global warming in my opinion was a, uh, I guess, bad marketing. Uh, climate change means more tumultuous events, more volatility. And we're seeing this all the time. We see California wildfires. We saw Australian wildfires. Uh, I mean, we've seen this in Texas. And again, this event was not a black swan event. It was very easily predictable. Um, it was cold, but it was not crazy cold. Uh, again, the, in Chicago, I walked to work in minus 42 degrees Fahrenheit uh, right. Right. the day the polar vortex hit. That was cold. I literally froze my face and wore all the clothes in my closet. Um, so that's kind of where, that's what I just have a hard time with is who needs to actually foot the bill for this winterization. And, uh, and I think it's a little bit of everybody. Um, I definitely think that if renewables, for instance, they get credits. And so they get credits they're incentivized to build. Well, so they can actually produce at a lower number than, uh, than a natural gas or a coal or a nuclear can. So, I mean, you look at that a little bit, maybe there should be a different price metric for someone who is subsidized or a higher standard of, hey, you need to actually weatherize uh, your plants. There were 12,000 megawatts that weren't available. Um, mm -hmm. So that's obviously not helpful. 12,000 out of the, I think, 28,000 to the capacity. Um, the other thing too is, um, I guess on the natural gas side, the pipes can very easily be weatherized. This happened during the polar vortex. And then it hasn't happened since because the Northeast said, hey, everybody get in line or you're getting serious fines. I mean, that's the way we get anyone to do anything, right? You find them, you yeah. hit their wallet. Um, and so that's, that's what I think is a lot of it. But at the end of the day, the, the thing that I'm most confused about and I would really appreciate the most clarity on is from ERCOT. 
Uh, when you put out a report in November of 2020 saying there's 80,000 um, megawatts available, you need to be pretty sure that the real number is not 45,000. Uh, I mean, yeah. you can't be off by that magnitude. If it was 80,000 and it came in at 72,000, no big deal. That's 10%, 10% bandwidth, no problem. Um, but right. when you're literally, I mean, <laughs> pushing 50%, of uh, what you're saying the capacity is, that to me is a problem uh, just in how you do your analysis. So I think a lot right. of the blend is there. Um, one of the other things too, just is uh, I'm putting in the, so they put in this thing called EEA3. Uh, and so it's energy emergency alert three. There's obviously a one, a two, and then three is the worst. So they put that in, but then they kept it in for Thursday and Friday after the blackouts were over and there was a lot of excess capacity. So it was just kind of one of those things that, I mean, it felt like the rules just kept changing and can't, it's, it's hard to like, it's hard to win a game when the rules change in the middle. Um, and so I think, and some of the rules help suppliers, some of the rules help generators, a lot of the rules hurt suppliers, a lot of the rules like hurt rate payers, all the rules hurt rate payers. So, I mean, yeah. that's one of the other big problems I had is you can't, you can't in a whim say, oh, by the way, like a touchdown's worth nine points for this team now, just because, you know, like that's how it's going to go. So, so dig, dig into that for me a little bit, because I, there's always been a convert, there's been a long standing conversation that the grid is outdated and there's issues there with upgrading, making upgrades and things like that. And obviously the ERCOT, you know, the utilities kind of where probably a lot of people's um, head goes first when, when they're thinking about what, what happened here. Um, but dig in a little bit specifically, not don't have to cover every, every rule change uh, as you put it, but dig in a little bit to like specifically what, what did they change? Give me an example and give our listeners and viewers an example of kind of what changed in the middle of the game and maybe some of the you know um results of that 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 hurt people i mean i think the biggest one is uh and i'm not i'm not going to hit this rule on the on the head exactly but there's a certain amount of prints of nine thousand. the market cap in ERCOT is nine thousand. it's uh different from the traditional capacity markets uh, in that it has a higher, they're encouraging people to build by increasing the price cap saying, hey, you can go get this magical $9,000 number as opposed to other markets that are in like the $1,000 plus range. And uh, so much, much higher price cap and they are going, um, yeah, that's what they're, they're incentivizing people to do. But there's a rule that only so many $9,000 prints can occur or 50 times natural gas. So the natural gas prices went out of control. It went from like 15 to 181 to 400. And so just, I don't know, I have only traded very, very limited natural gas, especially physical natural gas. So I'm not really sure how they got there. Obviously I understand supply and demand, but the difference between 181 and 400 is a big difference. Yeah. So um, ERCOT basically said, hey, we were going to continue to print 9,000s, just FYI, uh, even though they had hit the number of 9,000s they were supposed to be hitting. Because mm -hmm. then I think it goes to 50 times fuel or, uh, or $2,000 is next. So now it's going to be interesting as the summer rolls around, which is what the fear is in ERCOT, then guess what? If the price cap can only be 2,000 all summer because gas is super cheap, like three, four bucks during the summer, it'll never 50 times is a rounding error uh, compared to 9,000, then the price cap just drops significantly for summer. So that's just something that's kind of random and arbitrary, uh, continuing these EEA three alerts. So at Ampron, what we do is we, uh, we help our uh, help deregulated suppliers hedge. We have a platform for them. We give them a 15 day forecast on an hour by hour basis saying this is what you need to buy to fulfill your obligation. Obviously, it was very important. Uh, our data scientists did a great job because when a third of your customer base is out, there were four and a half million uh, outages out of 12 and a half million meters in Texas. Not all those meters in ERCOT, but the, the site I was looking at, that was the number they had, four and a half out of 12 and a half. So you're looking at 35 or so percent. 
Um, and so it was very, our data science team did a great job just using those outages and trying to give our customers the absolute best uh, forecast going forward. But then also going backwards, um, settlements are crucially important. So ERCOT is still having a hard time with settlements for those days, Monday through Wednesday, when all the power was down. So that's what we've been spending a lot of time um, with our clients as well is just saying, hey, this is what you actually owe. You're actually long. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, our clients are long, uh, getting back to the original question. So they're actually, they're fortunate because they hedge correctly. And so they're selling back into the market at 9,000. That helps them a lot because they were bleeding on like Saturday and Sunday had high prices. But then Thursday, the grid is healthy. And if the grid is healthy, the price should be therefore, I mean, a healthy price uh, in terms of, a hundred bucks or 20 bucks or something like that. And it wasn't, it was artificially capped at 9,000, um, which I've never seen that every, when I traded every five minutes, you just sat there on pins and needles waiting for the next print. And to know on, I think it was Tuesday that it's just going to be straight 9,000s for the rest of the day. It doesn't matter if people are using electricity, if people aren't, we've just, we've just arbitrarily mandated it. Now that was the biggest rule change that I think bothers me because our clients got load back on Thursday and Friday. And so they got load back and now they're being charged $9,000 and the grid's healthy. Um, the, I guess the reserve margin was 12,000 megawatts. That's a lot. When the grid was about to black out, right when I woke up at two o'clock in the morning, it was 400 megawatts. And, and at 2 a.m., obviously you've got a little higher usage than you do at 2 a.m. Uh, during the morning peak and the schedule was literally at 400 megawatts. So that's what I just don't understand. Um, I absolutely do not want to be in ERCOT's shoes right now. I'm not jealous of that position at all. Um, but nonetheless, um, I just changing the rules on the fly. They were in a hard situation, but some those are the kind of the two that I really don't understand because uh, it's not yeah. fair when you when you go in thinking the rules are, are X and they change to why yeah and it left some people with some pretty pretty hefty bills uh i know i, I read some you know of the kind of national stories the the big bills that i had some people um some friends who live down there and in the industry saying man i'm glad my power was out because uh i wouldn't have wanted to pay that utility bill i'm on real-time pricing and um so really really fascinating what happened and um what do you think going forward how can we how can we address this how can we change this um or how can the utility or suppliers act differently uh to to better be prepared for an event like this and make sure that that this doesn't happen again i mean i think the biggest thing people in texas uh are very fortunate in the fact that they have some of the cheapest electricity out there uh, I mean, if you if you were on Gritty, uh, obviously the most famous retailer out there after this, I had uh, my head of product was sitting in his house freezing and he said his saving grace was he got on Twitter and looked up hashtag Gritty just to see what people were saying because it's obviously a completely real-time based pricing and they encourage their customer to leave and you have to, Gritty is a great business model. I like it. I like time of use, but you have to understand what you're getting into. And you also have to have a house that essentially you can control exactly how it is necessary and shut off if you need to. Um, yeah. And I, I personally am not on it because I want a little bit of, uh, I mean, what Amperon does is hedging. We tell you to hedge. Why would I go get electricity that's not hedging? Um, right. So that's kind of one of my uh, biggest things. But we're very fortunate to have such low electricity prices so I think we should just add a little bit of a charge all across everyone, a little bit to the generators, a little bit to the end user, like a little bit to the gas pipelines, a little bit to everyone across the board and just mandate weatherization. Um, yep. That's what I really think is key because again, it was cold, but it was not that cold compared to what we see in the Northern United States. And uh, that's what I would do personally, because again, for like for fractions of a cent added to your bill, it's, it's not going to move the needle. You're going to go out there and you're going to, you're going to go and you're going to see this. And obviously it'll hit like 
commercial or industrial, but they pay the lowest rates anyways, because it's a flat, I mean, they have a very um, flat uh, load factor. And so, I mean, it's gonna, it would hit everyone evenly, but Texas is so inexpensive power wise. That's why you see a lot of companies moving here. That's why you see a lot of mining. That's why we have a steel mill going in. That's why Tesla's going in. Um, I mean, outside of the, the tax implications, but electricity is inexpensive here. The grid has so much renewables uh, and we're not getting nickel and dime for everything like California. And so we can just pay a little bit more to help with this winterization. And if everyone chips in, the next time this event will uh, comes, then it'll be it'll be a non-factor. Um, sure. Be some pipes, and so goes it. But uh, I mean, that that would be my answer personally. Well, it's good to know that there's a, a plausible solution out there. The big question is who's going to pay for it, right? And uh, and what's the funding mechanism for that? But I I, I don't have any uh, issues. I think with the way you put it, everybody kind of chips in and, and pays their fair share and make sure we we go and do what we need to do to make sure this doesn't happen again. So one of the things I'm shifting gears a little bit that I think is really cool about your company um, is it's very data driven. And I know you have a meteorologist on staff. So what are you looking at now? What are they looking at now? I've read a couple of articles that, hey, this might, this could happen again in March. There could be some cold weather in March. Uh, we're recording this, so our listeners know, on Friday, February 26th, and uh, we're hoping to get it out really soon thereafter because obviously this is a current event. But looking at the next two weeks or 30 days, what's your team saying? Are they seeing uh, an opportunity that this might happen again, or is that buzz? No, uh, I mean, the 11 to 15 day on the weather models uh, looked like they had a little hint of cold, but uh, in our weekly update or our daily update that we put out, uh, it all went away today. Um, our meteorologist has said it might be mild, cool, but it's not important. Um, but everyone obviously has like PTSD right after an event like this. Sure. I mean, you get hit with a hurricane, the next hurricane, everybody's like clogged up by 45 heading north. Um, yeah. So, and understandably so. But no, we don't see any more events like this. Uh, but I will say the the best uh, meteorologist out there is definitely uh, Puxatani Phil. He he nailed this six more weeks of winter thing. Yeah, yeah, and you heard it here first, by the way. The, Sean's team, uh, there. I I trust your word and your prediction. So um, I appreciate that insight. Um, really, really interesting. Um, how do you if you're a broker like you know and you have all these clients who a lot of them probably got dinged uh pretty hefty bills maybe 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 not i don't know what the percentage of people who actually had power and racked up really big charges but how do you explain this to your to your clients yeah i mean first and foremost if you have any large commercial even medium commercial uh and industrial clients you don't care about demand response or don't care to even be a part of the di multiple different products uh, that are out there. I think this is going to be a real eye opener uh, that, yeah, building owners do need to actually care. A lot of people are on a block and index. Uh, a block is where you just buy a flat number across all 24 hours or sometimes across just the on peak. So 6 a.m. To, to 10 p to 10 p.m and then you you float the rest. So you get whatever the real time is for your imbalance. That goes above and below. Um, so I think that that product could become more interesting because you would get paid if you lower below that block price and sell back to the grid. Um, so that's one thing that I think uh, from a broker standpoint, and then the customers who need a little more handholding, um, like I know like who introduced us, Andrew Barth, like they're great at this going out and helping uh, at CSD, the large commercial and industrial clients and saying, hey, this is um, like, this is what you can do in this event. You have generation. You can essentially become a virtual power plant and sell it back to the grid at $9,000. Well, that's really interesting to me. In fact, I would even call another company um, that I like is Enchanted Rock. And so Enchanted Rock goes and puts generation uh, there, they have all the HEB accounts. And so it, it was great to go to HEB and hear Enchanted Rock uh, bumping and a guy named Sean Andrews like posted that. And I was like, that's pretty funny. He went up to HEB to hear the 
these enchanted rock generators go. But guess what? You can go sell back to the grid and or just not lose your power, not lose obviously all the, the refrigeration that, that a grocery store has. Um, so, I mean, I would become more aware of that. Uh, also building efficiencies. Building efficiencies are cheap. This is not the early 2000s. This isn't like the first clean tech bubble where, I mean, the solar you put on your roof. I remember my uncle just feeling terrible about putting solar on people's roof because he knew it was not going to work. And this was again, like 20 something years ago. Now the solar, I mean, I watched the Tesla roof get installed uh, in Dana Point, California this summer. And it was a thing of beauty. Um, I mean, the roofs you can put up there, if you're a large commercial industrial, absolutely put solar on your roof. Uh, I mean, it's great and it makes you less reliant on other people. The way that you don't get affected by legislation is just pull yourself out of the legislation and be able to do these building upgrades. Um, so that's the real thing that I would take away from that. There's so many different things you can do to make your building more efficient. And it's unfortunate uh, that a lot of building owners, I used to deal with building owners in New York and I sold my company before local law 97 came, but local law 97 just forces everyone to go and actually make their building more energy efficient. So for the things that we're trying to do on the grid here, energy efficiency is key. And again, back to the whole, everybody chip in a little bit. If you're able to chip into your building, make it more efficient, change your regular lighting to LED, which people have been doing for dozens of years. Uh, then I mean, that's really what I see as the, the way that hopefully this is a wake up call to people who are just kind of complacent. Uh, I mean, from my standpoint, we've had suppliers who had said, mm, my forecast is fine. Like it's good enough. And now people understand that forecasting is extremely important. Uh, the other thing people don't understand, the grid is having issues right now, but guess what's coming? Everyone is bullish on electric vehicle. I see probably one in 1,000 LinkedIn posts that's like, go combustion engine. Uh, I mean, I just bought a new home and made sure that there was the, the big like, um, uh, what is it, like the 240 volt plug in the garage. I had the builder yep. put that in because I don't have a Tesla now, but I have a feeling that's gonna be my next car, almost for sure. And if not, when I sell this house in 10, 15 years, I believe that's gonna be the way of the future. And it'd be like having a gas station in your garage. Well, that's a great that's idea. Cool. Uh, I'd pay more for a house for that. So just things like that, if the electric vehicle penetration gets where it is, the grid's gonna have more issues than there are today. So if you don't go and actually weatherize your building, uh, there are some fun upgrades you can do on your home, but they don't move the needle as much. It's going to save you five, 10, $20 per month. Um, but if you're a commercial or industrial person, you need to go do this and you need to have someone who knows what they're doing. There's unfortunately some bad actors out there. So you need to get a qualified someone to go out there and help you with this. Um, so that's one of the things I really hope opened a lot of people's eyes just because this is important. This is how we get to our energy efficiency goals. Um, putting up more windmills is one thing, but actually people taking responsibility for themselves is kind of the biggest, in my opinion. Well, I'm picking up what you're putting down there. Uh, I would not be a good salesperson if I didn't say that Biostar does a lot of those things you just mentioned, and we'd love to uh, to come out and check if you're listening or watching and you're interested in, in looking at your building efficiency. That is exactly what we do. Um, so thank you for that. And I completely agree. You know, it's, it's time to tackle the low hanging fruit. If you've been looking at a led lighting project and it's been sitting on somebody's desk for five years, go do it. It's a good investment in your building. Your employees will be happier. Go grab that low hanging fruit and start saving money and, and know that you really are contributing to the bigger picture when you do that. Um, all really good stuff. Sean, thank you so much for coming on again. It's, it's great to see you and good luck with the final stretch of the pregnancy. Um, tell our listeners how they can find you online, LinkedIn, Twitter. What are you, uh, are you tweeting? Where, where can they find you? Yeah. So I do a lot on, uh, on LinkedIn. And so you can definitely find me on there. Um, Amperon, uh, is also does a lot on LinkedIn. My co-founder is pretty fun on Twitter. Um, Abe Stanway. And then, um, yeah, and then my emails, uh, Sean, S-E-A-N, at Amperon, A-M-P-E-R-O-N dot C-O. Um, so feel free to shoot me an email. Always like to have interesting conversations. Uh, these, these last three weeks have been drinking out of a fire hose, so I'm a little behind in, 
and David and I are in the same boat. He's going to give me all his notes since he's two months ahead of us in terms of having a kid. Oh, yeah. So I, I expect just a just an API flow uh, of all your of all exactly what to do. I'll I'll send my my reading from my Kindle, you know, straight over as I finish it, and uh, I'll filter out the bad stuff. No, that sounds great. And Sean mentioned a couple of folks on the show. Uh, Andrew Barth, who is a partner over at CSD Energy Advisors. We have an episode with him on the podcast. Um, you also mentioned Sean Andrews, who is, uh, has an episode coming out here in the next couple of weeks. So look out for that. And um, if anybody, if you're not following or subscribed to the podcast, please go and do that wherever you listen to your podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Renewables, What Happened in Texas. Sean, I learned a lot, and uh, we hope you'll come back later this year. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. Yep. Take care.